Hello and welcome to Healing Insights. My name is Susie Daggett and I bring this show every week to help us explore the connection between the mind, the body, and the spirit. There are many, many people in our community that are starting to bring these three elements together for their own healing. And every week I like to bring a different practitioner on for you to understand more of what's going on. Well, today I have somebody really special who's not just a local national, but an international man who has been involved in many, many levels of expanding consciousness. I'd like to suggest that you watch very carefully as I talk to, Doc, to Skip Atwater, who is a director of research at the Monroe Institute. So I'd like to introduce Skip. Welcome, Skip. Hi. Nice to be here, Susan. Yes. Well, thank you very much. I know you're here on family getting to know your family a little better yes, your long lost old family. yes long lost uncle which is wonderful herb dimmick which well, he many isn't so lost he is, no he is not at all lost so <laughs> <laughs> many people in the community know herb he's been around for a long time and has many books um and you're here to visit him and and rekindle a connection and to visit with you and to yes and to do an event with new frontiers and gold country ions but let's first start about Monroe Institute. This is a place that, that some people know about and other people don't, but it is one of the leading institutes for helping people expand consciousness. And since you're the director of research, you're going to explain this to our audience. All right. Um, the founder of the Monroe Institute was a man named Robert Monroe. And Robert Monroe had his initial career in New York he was uh, in the heydays of radio back in the 1950s. Perhaps mm. um, you remember the radio program, The Shadow? Ooh. What evil lurks in the hearts and minds of evil men? Only uh -huh. the shadow knows. He, well, was he the shadow? No. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> that would be... idea. Yeah. <laughs> he's he a shadow the, now. <laughs> he was the producer. Uh -huh. He produced that show. So he was a vice presidential level of these highfalutin radio production companies made his millions in New York and then became interested in something called sleep learning. In the late 50s and early 60s, perhaps you remember the idea of sleep learning. And was that, now tell me what, there, there's another word for that. Well, in that day and age, it was the American dream to get something for nothing, right? The yes. 1950s. So. You could put your algebra book under your bed and maybe wake up and know algebra. That's where I was going. <laughs> I knew that there was that connection, that you well, could put a tape under your pillow and be smarter in the morning. Well, actually, Edgar Cayce was the one mm. who said that that was a way to focus your intent to learn, is to make that part of your dream life. But this form of dream or sleep learning that Mr. Monroe was interested in had to do with the idea of playing the old 33 RPM records and on the records you might have a foreign language or you might have your multiplications tables and the idea was is that you would play this while you slept at night and you'd wake up knowing a foreign language or knowing your math tables. Is that also called subliminal? Um, it's a different science altogether. Okay. Different science altogether. Now the scientists and the Federal Trade Commission became interested in all these wild claims about being able to do sleep learning and get something for nothing. And what they found out was that, sure enough, in the early stages of sleep, stage one, stage two sleep, they could, the next day, measure more vocabulary words in a foreign language, mm -hmm. or you knew your times tables, your additions tables better. But if you fell off into slow wave sleep, unconscious sleep, that there was no learning. Mm -hmm. Mr. Monroe wanted to figure out a way to prolong this period of early sleep, or what he called mind awake, body asleep, state so that he could utilize this concept of sleep learning. So mm -hmm. he experimented with different kinds of ways to stimulate mind awake, body asleep and he came up with the notion of a sound technology being a radio man and was the guy who made all the footsteps across the floor and oh, the dramas yeah. <laughs> and the creaky doors and everything uh -huh. so being a sound oriented person was able to come up with uh, the use of a phenomenon known as binaural beating or putting a slightly different sound in one ear than the other and creating a vibrato between the sounds 
stimulated the brain or calmed down the brain and got into this ideal state of mind awake but body asleep. And therefore, from there, you can go into an expanded consciousness. Well, he didn't think about that at the time. Uh -huh. he, he was chasing sleep learning. Okay. Until one night when he found himself, after hundreds of hours in his laboratory experimenting with this sound pattern, he found himself laying in bed at night and realizing, I'm, I'm awake. I am wide awake, and yet my body is totally asleep. That's, this is exactly what I've been trying to create in the laboratory. And he was thinking, this is very interesting. And he began to say, I wonder what I can sense or feel or know. And he felt what he thought was the sheets. And he said, these are very rough. Maybe there's too much starch in the sheets. And he looked over to the right and he thought he saw a fountain in his bed. And he couldn't imagine what a fountain was coming out of his bed. Mm -hmm. Was this a strange dream? No, it couldn't be a dream because he was wide awake. And when he looked straight ahead, down he saw himself and his wife in bed. And he panicked. Oh no, I've died. And he immediately dove back down into his bed and his body sat up. That was close. I almost died. This is horrible. And he spent the next six, eight months going to his medical doctor, a psychiatrist, his minister trying to find out what was wrong with him. Was, was this something terrible, some foreboding disease he had? Well, they eventually convinced him that he was quite normal. There was nothing wrong with him. Nothing he had, wrong. He had jumped. He had made that jump. Yes. That he, that he maybe um, wanted to make without knowing that that's where he was going. Well, what happens when your body goes to sleep and your mind stays awake? Mm -hmm. There was a whole world out there that he had no idea existed and eventually wrote his first book, Journeys Out of the Body. And that was the foundation for what the Monroe Institute is today, some 40 years later now, 40 and 50 years later, of helping people explore states of consciousness connected with putting the body to sleep and allowing your mind, your consciousness, your awareness to say awake and clear and exploring those avenues of consciousness. So your body's in a safe place. Yes. And it and and you set it up obviously because you've come on board at, and you've been there what ten years about fifteen now. fifteen years, and you've taken your technology which doggone we don't have enough time to talk about all this but you've taken your knowledge and and married it with his abilities and and brought out I don't know if Hemisync was available before you came or if you brought that terminology. Well, Hemisync out. was developed back in the early 60s, and mm -hmm. I didn't meet Bob until 1977. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was with the government remote viewing program, and I was trying to find out whether or not the Hemisync technology would help the remote viewers in their job. And eventually retired from the military and, and been working at the Institute for the last 15 years. Well, we might tell the viewers at this point that what remote viewing is. Because oh. how you even got, in, got the chance to, to meet and work with Bob Monroe was because of your work with the government in what we now can call remote viewing. What we can now, well, you already called it that, but mm -hmm. now there are conferences on remote viewing. There yes. are people that talk about it constantly. Yes. There are people that practice it. But you were the pioneer. Well, I certainly had one little piece of the pie of a much larger perspective. Um, the remote viewing is the ability to mentally perceive and describe locations, activities, people that are distant from you by they're too many miles away. I can't see them with my own eyes or are blocked because they're behind another wall. I can't see through the wall, but mentally I might be able to perceive. You might think of this as ESP or clairvoyance in a way, but in a controlled laboratory procedure, in a protocol that uh, restricts any other way of knowing other than psychically becoming aware of this information. Yes, and I, and I might mention that even if you are intuitive or psychic, that does not mean that you have the ability to do remote viewing. Only because the remote viewing is controlled within specific protocols. Mm -hmm. um, but it's perfectly okay to be a wonderful intuitive and a wonderful psychic, but you wouldn't call yourself a remote viewer because it isn't under these scientific protocols. Right. That's very well pointed out. Well, because I've tried it. 
<laughs> <laughs> and I'm very intuitive, and I know a lot of things, but if I try and do remote viewing, it is not a skill that I've brought forward. Right. That doesn't mean that I can't. I just have not worked with that level. Well, because of its scientific basis, <clears throat> the government became interested in its use as a surveillance tool for intelligence purposes. Mm -hmm. And my role was to suggest that we train government people to do this rather than find talented people. So the notion of training or teaching people how to do remote viewing was the little piece of role I played for 10 years in the government. Little piece. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and you're then, very modest. And then left and joined the Monroe Institute. And at the Monroe Institute we have many different uh, classes of instruction, eight different classes of instruction in altered states that people go to to learn different things that they can utilize their greater being mm -hmm. more than the physical body. What are you and who can you be, explore, and know when you accept the perspective that you are more than your physical body? Well, and that's obviously the key to what has kept this institute going over and over and over again, that people are looking for what is bigger than them, yes. what is more than them. Yes. And being in an extended state of consciousness, you can feel it. Bob Monroe said that the only way to know is to find out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so we can read books, we can talk to people, we can have dinner table discussions about, well, I think that that's true, and yes, I might be more than my physical body. I can intellectually conceive of that. But as Mr. Monroe said, the only way you're going to know, really know, is to find out for yourself. And that's what the Monroe Institute offers, mm -hmm. is a participatory, experiential exploration so that you might know for yourself. Now, uh, where is it located? The I want to say Virginia, and I know that's not right. Well, it's in Virginia, oh. in, in rural Virginia, just south of Charlottesville. Oh, okay. And interestingly enough, I'm here speaking to you in California, mm -hmm. uh, the IONS people have opened a new retreat center just north of Golden Gate in Petaluma. Right. And we are offering classes there as well. So people on so the West Coast can go to the oh. local IONS retreat center. So the Monroe Institute is now bicoastal. Well, we are Some, in partner, a little bit. We're in partnership with IONS. Oh, and how it's wonderful. A, and it's a co-developed procedure, and we're really excited about the expansion. Oh, that'll help both. Um, for those who don't know, IONS is the Institute of uh, Noetic Sciences um, that was started... Um, Founded by Ed Mitchell yeah, some years ago. Yeah, an astronaut. And they also look at expanded states of consciousness um, a little bit on the mental point of view. Yes. You know, yes. and um, so here you are bringing the experiential in with them. Yes. What a nice thing. Now, my vision is, from from reading your book, which we'll get to in a minute, is that uh, do you go into a chamber to get your mind to be very mm -hmm. quiet, and then you have music? Is that the hemisync mm -hmm. part of it? W would you explain that? Well, first of all, we don't think that that is the ultimate answer. What we, we call the tools that we have training wheels. Okay. Just like you might learn how to do this, learn how to balance on a bicycle, and then you can take the training wheels off. So if we're going to talk about the training wheels, yes, we have sound technology involving the use of this binaural beating or this vibrato, putting a slightly different sound in one ear than the other, which alters your brain waves, and a series of tapes with exercises that you do over a week-long period mm -hmm. on these tapes so that you're familiar with this navigation of these territories. Much like if you were thrown into a swimming pool, you wouldn't know how to navigate or turn or get from one point to the other. And so we very gently guide you through the tools, give you a compass by which you might steer through these tools and adventuring. What are you outside of your physical body? I bet that's scary for some people. Well, fear is one of the things that sort of holds us back. Mm -hmm. But let's look for a minute at fear since you brought it up. Okay. It's an interesting it's concept. A, it's a fascinating thing because yes. unfortunately our world is being ruled by fear. Well, a very wise, wise person once mentioned to me that the ultimate fear, the root of fear, 
is that we are separate from God. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what started the whole thing. That's the fear of death, is that, ooh, what will happen on the other side? Well, guess what? what? It's really stupid. <laughs> I mean, by the nature of the creation, we cannot be separate from God. That's right, because we are. Right. <laughs> so what are we to do with this thing called fear that we experience if it doesn't make sense? Well, that's, that is a human point if I've ever heard one. <laughs> so what do we do with this? Because people want to know. I think you use it as a reminder. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a way of reminding. Say, wait a minute, I must be crazy, I'm afraid. And I cannot be separate from God, therefore there's nothing to be afraid of. So whenever we feel the fear, we use it as a reminder saying, I must be looking at this incorrectly. I must be literally out of my mind to be afraid. There must be some other way to look at this because I cannot be separate from the Creator. And when you live your life that you're not separate, that you are one, things are so much easier. Yes. Life just goes. Yes. It's okay. Yes. You know, because you're being taken care of, you're being supportive, but boy, we tend to forget that. And you so are part in of, harmony. Yes. You are not in dis-ease. Yes. You are in harmony. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And even if you have dis-ease around you, the more you bring the harmony in, I think the better you are able to handle whatever disease is going. If you have a physical thing going on in your body, the more you bring the harmony in and remember, it's a temporary blip. Mm -hmm. we're, we're here as humans as a temporary blip. You know, some people tend to think this is all there is, but I have a different take on it. Well, you're more than your physical body. <laughs> yes, 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 and I'm glad. That, and I've never experienced the hemisync. I've listened to a little of the music that's called metamusic. Yes, and, and there is some hemisync in that. Yes. Okay, explain what metamusic is, because I'm going to go back to my drawer and find my tape and get it out now. Okay. <clears throat> this vibrato sound, the rate of vibrato, is what alters your brain waves through neurochemistry, which we won't go into this morning. Right. And we have put this into several different formats. Uh, one has to do with guided mental imagery, or guided meditations. Others have to do with affirmations, giving yourself affirmations in altered states of consciousness. Others have to do with background sounds that you might use to reduce anxiety. So we mix the vibrato beating binaurals binaural beat mm -hmm. with music and then we call that meta music okay meaning that you can listen to different kinds of music some for meditation some have been used with kids that have uh, learning disabilities and playing the music in the background to improve their learning capabilities mm. others have used it for example in dentist's office to reduce anxiety before you go in to see your dentist in the waiting room they'll pay some nice meditative meta music in the background so when you go in to see the dentist, you're not filled with anxiety and worry and concern. And the patient doesn't even know that. They just feel calmer. Fine. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> um, I want to go back to fear a little bit because I, uh, we kind of... Oh, I don't want to go back. Oh, I know. You, don't, <laughs> you want to stay in the bliss. But, but I want to talk about how people get out of fear when they mm -hmm. come to the Monroe Institute or go to Petaluma to IONS and, and work with this whole process of of how to understand more of who mm -hmm. they are and their first thing is I'm not doing this yes because I, I, I imagine that 90 percent of the people mm -hmm. you know they go there with good intentions but then they get faced right up to mm -hmm. whoa this is too much for me to handle mm -hmm. it's a very common thing mm -hmm. and we have to remember that uh, fear is an ego-based situation that darn ego. ego meaning self mm -hmm. and ego is all about the body mm -hmm. protection and defense of the body oh yeah let's not let the spirit handle this because I know better than the spirit. So the way that we have people work through this is through very gradual desensitization. And the idea is you walk into this gently and then step back. and See, it's okay. So you walk into it gently. Much like, let's use a swimming metaphor. Mm. You would walk down the first step into the swimming pool and you'd swish your feet around. and Well, this is okay. This feels good. Then you'd step back. I want more. And then you go down two steps and then three steps and pretty soon you're up to your waist and maybe you'll be able to hold on to the side and let your legs float up after and then you get out 
and you're teaching very slowly, desensitizing the fear factor. Being in the water, immersing my body in the water is not unsafe. Mm -hmm. I can go into and I can come out and I understand it. And that's the same way in which we teach using the hemisync process is to gradually introduce these things and then step back and talk about it as a group. What mm -hmm. was your experience like? What was that about? Let's go in again. And of course, each time you go into the next step, you have to do the first one, then the second one, then the third one, and then you back up. And the next time you try, you go one, two, and three again. Mm -hmm. So pretty soon, that first adventure into consciousness becomes just normal to you. Mm -hmm. and, and I would imagine that you don't want to use this music when you're driving. <laughs> That's true. We have, <laughs> we have some uh, products that have to do with awake and alert and stimulating. So for those on a commute... That might That's be an interesting one. thing. Yes. But we do have imprinted on the CDs themselves, do not use while operating heavy machinery or while driving, mm -hmm. because they're designed to be more meditative. Mm -hmm. So what do people who are in this fast-paced life of ours, what can they do to start exploring their consciousness if they can't get to the Monroe Institute? Mm -hmm. what, what tools do you guys have outside of the Institute itself? Well, understand that there are many, many organizations around uh, just going to yoga classes, going mm -hmm. to Tai Chi classes uh, are a way. Once you have that inkling in you to search and find, what is there more to God's creation than this? Am I actually more than this? Everybody has to find their own path, their own divine right path. Mm -hmm. We at the Institute offer a technologically based sound technology you can get these tapes and CDs to try at home. Mm -hmm. Or you can go to one of the classes and participate in a group for a week-long situation. And, and you have a website, yes. MonroeInstitute.org, yes. mm -hmm. and that, that gives all the information. Yes, people can find out on the internet at MonroeInstitute.org and find out about our classes, or if they think they want to try some of these things at home, then they can just follow the links over to... Click yeah. on the buttons and yeah. you go get them. Right? right. Now let's talk about something that you just completed. I'm going to show a picture of your book. It's, well, it's a year, not a year old. Almost. Pretty new. It's pretty new. Pretty yes. new. Mm -hmm. And it's called um, Captain of My Ship. I'm trying to get it up here right there. Okay. Now, you wrote this because this is your story. Yes. Uh, and it's uh, a very wonderful story, I have to tell you. I enjoyed reading oh, it thank very, you very much. much. I did have all skip over the technological part. That's my way. I go, oh, technology, I don't think I need to know that. So tell us about why you, uh, why you wanted to write this great book. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the book because many people who have read it since it came out several months ago have thanked me for the book, but they focused on one thing. Say, oh, I really needed to hear this. Thank you for writing about this. And it's, from an author's perspective, it's nice to have these people grateful, but each of them find in the book something that's significant for them. That's right. And yet, my writing of the book, the subtitle of the book is Living with Guidance. And my writing of the book was to tell how, although I've been through this very interesting life with military psychic spying and working at the Monroe Institute now and talking to wonderful people like you, that I have a sense looking back that I was very carefully guided and there was a sense of direction all along throughout my life. And I picked that up in the book, you know, because that, I think that if your family is alerted to the ability to go into different realms, mm -hmm. they support you along, that happened with you, mm -hmm. that happened with me, and I'm so thankful for it, and, um, and it just helps. There are many people that don't have that, and they they get there on their own, but the guidance. Yes, the guidance is always there for everybody. So I hope the readers of my book are reminded in their life that they set the book down for a minute and say, you know, I remember when I was a kid, and that must have been guidance working for me too, mm -hmm. because guidance works for everybody. And it's there all the time. It's just our remembering of it because, again, there's that ego that comes in and says, I did that. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what does remembering mean? It means putting together again mm -hmm. to remember, to assemble the parts again. Mm -hmm. Over 
and over and over. But it's always there. It's always in the mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got your book. You you do a lot of speaking, a lot of teaching all over the place. Yes. And, um, and you're here in town, which is wonderful. What do you do in your spare time? Well, that's an interesting situation. I create my own spare time. Oh, <laughs> now see, I want, we have about three minutes. So tell me how you create your own spare time. Well, one has to make time. If, if in remote viewing we learn that space and time aren't relevant, right. it, they become very malleable, meaning mm -hmm. you can make as much time as you want to. Isn't that you, fun? You can make it as you want to. Mm -hmm. So recently I have become interested in the awareness of the healing process, in, in healing one's own self and healing the body of mankind at the same time. So uh, extending, not only looking at someone else, someone may come to me and say, oh, I have a problem, I feel ill, or there's something wrong, to look at them through God's eyes as being a perfect reflection of God, an angel, and not seeing what they have as being out of order, not seeing something broken that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And the way one manifests that is to, in seeing themselves in that way. Pretty powerful stuff. And since this show is called Healing Insights, I think you gave us some healing insights. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, seeing, seeing yourself as perfect. And that is, that again, it's just And the like reflection of myself and everyone I meet. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That mirroring. Yes. Isn't that a wonderful quality to be able to, to model for people? Because I think that's how we start changing is when they see, oh, look at Skip. He's pretty calm and pretty neat. I wonder what he knows mm -hmm. that I don't know. Do you know? I understand the, the words you say and the way it, we have to trail it out to understand and to grasp it. The magic is seeing it as perfect and not needing to be fixed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The magic. And there is so much magic in this world. And you bring the magic to the people with all of your technology. Which, who would have thought that technology would be bringing magic? But it does, mm -hmm. you know? Well, God created technology. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And you had, you brought it to Bob Monroe because he was at a point where he didn't know how to take it further. Right. And he, you had that ability. Yeah. He, he came up through the 1950s technology, pre-computer world and pre-internet world and so forth and so on. And now we've grown from that and beyond. He's left us a wonderful, wonderful legacy of tools and the exploration of consciousness. And now we've expanded that into the highest levels of technology. As you expand your consciousness, you expand technology. Oh, yes. There you go. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much, Skip, for coming on the program. Thank you, Susie. This is always fun. My name is Susie Daggett. I bring you this show, and I thank you very much for tuning in to Healing Insights. I wish you all the most wonderful healing. Thank you. <laughs>